Cursor, fuller, what does that mean? It's ZX Spectrum Joystick Confusion. If you've ever played a Spectrum game, either on the real hardware, on an emulator, or one of the newly reissued clones, then you may have noticed the fairly baffling array of options on the title screen. Some of them may be self-explanatory like Game Start or Keyboard Control, but some of the others aren't quite so clear. Kempston, Interface 2, Protec, Fuller, AGF? What do these things do? Well, they're all joystick interfaces. You see, the original ZX Spectrum models didn't have built-in joystick ports. There was no way to connect a joystick to the original system directly. There wasn't even a delete key or a reset button, so clearly joystick ports were too much to ask. But of course, the ZX Spectrum fairly quickly became a very popular games machine. So many companies, sensing a gap in the market, created joystick interfaces. These were devices that connected to a ZX Spectrum and allowed you to plug in a 9-pin Atari compatible joystick, something that was becoming a de facto standard on 8-bit home computers of the era. So, no more mashing the keyboard, and instead you can enjoy the luxury of joysticks just like those uppity C64 owners and their dun-hued yet joystick-enabled bread boxes. One of the most popular ones came from a company named Kempston, and pretty much every game that allowed joystick control gave you the option to use this. Another popular option was Sinclair's own Interface 2, which gave the the Spectrum, two joystick ports and a cartridge slot as well. Spectrum games on cartridge never really took off, but a lot of games did support the joystick part of it. On top of that, there were devices from companies like Protec, AGF, Fuller and many others. A lot of these being clones of the other already widely supported joystick interfaces. The thing is, although all these interfaces did basically the same thing, they tended to do it in different ways. The joystick inputs were sent to the Spectrum in a sort of different format, meaning they weren't compatible with each other at a software level and games developers had to give the user different options on the title screen. There was a lot of choice and no particular one of these interfaces became the dominant standard. Although some fell by the wayside over the years, right up until the end of the Spectrum's life, games developers had to support multiple joystick formats plus a keyboard option for those that didn't have one at all. That's all fair enough I suppose, but things only get more confusing from here. Just to add to the puzzlement, these joystick interfaces weren't always labelled in the same way. The Sinclair Interface 2 might be called simply Sinclair, or just Interface 2, or SJS, or some combination of the three. You might see an option labelled Cursor, Protec, AGF, or some variation thereof. This referred to joysticks that mapped the Spectrum's cursor keys, such as they were really just keys 5, 6, 7 and 8 on the top row of the keyboard, and the companies Protec and AGF both made interfaces that did this. Add to that the fact that nearly every game had its own unique way of configuring the controls, and things could be pretty impenetrable for the new user. Getting your joystick to work often required a lot of trial and error, and could still end in disappointment when you realised you were stuck with a weird and unalterable default keyboard layout. Attic Attack was a fantastic game, but it was particularly guilty of this. Don't have a compatible joystick? Well, you're going to be playing with Q, W, E, R and T as the fire button. And no, there's no way to change it. The whole joystick situation was clouded even further thanks to Amstrad, who bought Sinclair in 1986 after the company got in financial trouble. They continued production of the Spectrum, still under the Sinclair brand, with two new models, the Plus 2 and the Plus 3. These had many improved features over the original models, including a built-in cassette deck or disk drive, a much improved keyboard with a delete key, and at long last, integrated joystick boards. Now that would have been great, but Amstrad being Amstrad, where dodgy design decisions were pretty much a company policy, they said to themselves, you know what, what we really need to do is make the whole joystick situation just a bit more baffling, because kids love being frustrated by weird design decisions when they're trying to play computer games. That's what the focus groups are telling us. The new models implemented the Sinclair Interface 2 standard, which made sense because it was already pretty popular and of course they own the rights to it. But in an attempt to sell their very crappy Sinclair branded joysticks, Amstrad changed the pinout on the joystick port, meaning that most joysticks on the market wouldn't work on the new machine out of the box. Only their own very crappy stick in a bucket SJS1 joystick would. This problem was alleviated fairly quickly as other manufacturers started making better Sinclair compatible joysticks and adapters also appeared that would allow you to use other joysticks that weren't. But it would still leave a pretty big gotcha for people who weren't in the know. But none of this really explains why there have to be so many different options in the first place. Couldn't games just auto detect what you're using? Modern games on PC or console allow you to seamlessly switch between different inputs, mouse and keyboard, joypad, motion controller, weird VR gadget, whatever, you can just pick it up and start using it. In fact, even going back to the Super NES with the mouse controller, you could switch between mouse and 
joypad on the fly just by plugging them in. Can't the Spectrum do something similar? Well, no, and there's two reasons why. Firstly, the ZX Spectrum was hardly a powerful machine and typically games would read player inputs ideally every frame. Going through all possible inputs every frame all the time would have made for complex, inefficient code and would have wasted CPU time that could be better spent on the game. Plus, some of these interfaces' inputs overlapped. They would send the Spectrum the same signals, but with different meanings. Cursor-type joysticks, as I've said, mapped to keys 5, 6, 7 and 8, and Sinclair's interface 2 mapped to 6, 7, 8 and 9. Essentially, moving the joystick would simulate a key being pressed on the keyboard. But without some kind of user configuration, there was no way to tell if that 8 was a cursor joystick right or a Sinclair down or even some weird user-defined keyboard layout and had some entirely different meaning. So given the technical considerations, these options on the title screen were really the only solution a lot of the time. Most of the other 8-bit machines of the time didn't have anything like these control input complexities. They tended to have joystick ports built in from the start. And this is just another of the Spectrum's rich and varied quirks. You know, I've only really scratched the surface of the strange world of Spectrum joysticks. I haven't mentioned user programmable joystick interfaces, joysticks that clip onto the keyboard, or all the difficulties of dealing with emulation and modern remade Spectrum hardware, but I think I've said enough for now. A lot of this stuff just doesn't seem to be recorded anywhere outside of ancient computer magazines. You could write a book about this, not a wildly interesting book I'm sure, but there's enough material. Thanks for watching, if you've enjoyed this please subscribe and if either of my viewers, you know, one of the two of you, have any suggestions about what I might cover in future videos, well, let me know in the comments and I'll have a think about it.